Hi, I'm Will uh, from Reproducibility, and I will in this video talk what talk about how how to improve your research with registration. My goals for this video are to introduce what a registration is and why it came about, suggest what I think are the best practices with registration, and describe the benefits of registration, especially for early career researchers. This is one of my favorite images to do with statistics and science. This is um, uh, data that Abraham Wald, a statistician, collected during World War II. He was looking at um, planes that came back from combat and depicting, what, with red dots here, where the bullet holes were. Now, on an initial glance, if you were to try and reinforce, you, you were thinking about where to reinforce the planes, uh, you might on instinct think we need to protect um, the places where we see those bullet holes. But Abraham Wald wisely showed that we should actually reinforce the places where we don't see those bullet holes. Now, that's because um, the planes that do make it back uh, don't need to be protected in the areas where they were shot, but it's the ones where we don't see the planes coming back, those are the weak spots of the plane. And this is, an, is known as survivorship bias. And this is similar to science because um, science has an overall uh, selection bias or publication bias. So imagine this plane seems, represents the published scientific literature. What makes it in and what doesn't? One concerning trend in science is the decline of negative results. It appears that the proportion of papers reporting a positive result has been increasing from 70% in the 1990s to approximately 90% by 2005. Now, this seems to be the trend across all disciplines in science. Here in the figure, you can see um, it's been split into psych physical, biological, and social sciences, and you can see an upward trend in all three graphs. In a recent estimate, the recent psycho psychology literature seems to have a proportion of positive results close to 95%. Now this is concerning because this cannot accurately reflect the world. Uh, firstly, scientists are not that successful with their experiments, and it's uh, unlikely that this is going to reflect all the true effects in the world. So part of this led, led to science undergoing a reproducibility crisis. And the reproducibility crisis is this widespread concern that published studies do not replicate or cannot be reproduced in the first place. I've picked out three uh, examples. First is in psychology. In the reproducibility project psychology, which was this multi-lab, hugely large-scale collaborative project, um, they tried to replicate 100 published findings. Out of those 100 published studies, there were 97 that reported positive effects. And out of the 97 replications, only 35 reproduced the positive result in the originally published um, papers. So that's approximately 36%. A similar kind of thing happened in cancer biology. Um, they tried to replicate 100 studies, 97 of which had positive results, and only 39 out of those 97 studies reproduced the positive result originally reported in high-impact articles. In economics, 11 out of 18 studies rep reproduced the positive result originally published in high-ranking journals. So overall, this is less than 50% if you sum those up, the results that are being replicated uh, that is being published. And note that the replications, even when they were successful, often reported smaller effect sizes. And this can be very important. Consider the case of cancer biology, where these studies may inform medical interventions. If these interventions are, in fact, not reproducing or have smaller effect size, this has real-world outcomes where the intervention may not be as successful as advertised or may require different administration um, to produce the desired outcomes. So 
it seems like in our published literature this plane here, a lot of the bullet holes are actually positive studies and we're not seeing the negative results. Uh, so it's possible that um, there's a proliferation of positive results that don't reflect the true world. So let's consider just one of these dots. Why are there so many positive results? This is um, a famous story in the field of psychology. This is a story of Daryl Bem in 2011, who published a study called Feeling the Future. And Daryl Bem at the time was a well-respected professor of social psychology at the time, and believed he had found positive evidence for precognition and premonition, the ability to sense or feel what was going to happen in the future. And it seemed like a, a typical experiment that you would see in these studies or in these journals. It had nine experiments over a thousand participants and had your standard statistical analyses such as your t-tests and your ANOVAs. And it was also published in the prestigious journal of personality and social psychology where it was peer-reviewed. But this cannot be true. We definitely do not have this ability to sense, simply sense the future. It's clearly a false positive. So what happened? Well, uh, reanalysis of the data and the methods revealed that it seemed that some participants were experiencing one set of uh, procedures and the second half of participants were experiencing a different procedure. So it seems like there was either changing of procedures halfway through the experiment or some sort of unprincipled combining of various data sets. There also seem to appear, be a post hoc combination of various dependent variables um, to create new measures which showed the significant effects. And these, this post hoc combination seemed to be um, driven by having looked at the data as well as not being theoretically or principled in any way. Also, there were many marginally significant results. So what this means is that if you're using a significance level of 0.05, a lot of the p-values seemed very close to that boundary, for example, 0.048. And part of this may have been due to the incorrect use of one-sided t-tests instead of two-sided t-tests, where one-sided t-tests you are confident or you make the assumption that you know the direction of the effect, whereas two-sided t-tests you don't. You assume you don't know this direction of the effect. And by using a one-sided t-test, you give yourself more power uh, to find a significant result. And it was also seen that there was changing significance or alpha levels across various experiments. So this did not seem to be justified or principled uh, in conducting the experiment. So all of the things I mentioned, in a, which was like a perfect storm that produced these positive results, uh, are known as questionable research practices or QRPs. And one concern for the reproducibility crisis is that the cause is a preponderance of questionable research practices that le led to a high proportion of false positive findings. Some examples of QRPs include stopping or continuing data collection after checking the significance of results. So for example, looking at the p-value of your analysis and deciding to either add more subjects or to stop. Um, for example, if you see your p-value is 0.052, you might want to collect a few more subjects to slightly power your study further. This is known as p-hacking and is a questionable research practice. Others include selective reporting of significant tests or omission of non-significant tests, so revealing a biased view of the experiment's results, and also claiming to have predicted an unexpected finding known as hypothesis after results known or harking. John et al did a survey of psychology, psychology researchers asking them whether they had um, done a, any questionable research practices that you can see listed in the figure on the right. And the self-admission rate for a lot of these uh, questionable research practices are quite high. And for the ones I've actually listed on the slide, they're closer to 70%, almost 80%. Now, if we try and derive the prevalence in the actual literature from these self-admission rates, if 80% are almost 80%, 80% are admitting to doing these questionable research practices, it's likely that all of us at some point may have um, conducted one of these uh, questionable research practices in our own research and may have inflated our um, uh, a a false positive rate. So um, altogether, 
we realized that we needed a solution and the proposed reform was a pre-registration. A pre-registration is the practice of publishing the plan for a study, including the research questions and hypotheses, the research design and data analysis before the data has been collected or examined. So there are two important aspects. One is that you publish the plan for the study so it's open and transparent. And the second is that you do this before the data has been collected or examined to try and limit any researcher bias into the analysis. So what is a pre-registration? It is a transparent documentation of what was planned at a certain time point. And what this allows is for third parties like peer reviewers to assess deviations from the research plan. And this means we can check the validity of the analyses and prevent questionable research practices such as p-hacking and hacking. I'm also going to add that I think it's a useful framework for increasing research rigor and reproducibility. In this next part, I'm going to talk about what I think are the best practices with registration. The first place is to choose a registry. Some current popular places to pre-register include GitHub, as predicted, Zenodo, and OSF, the Open Science Framework. Here, I recommend using the pre-registration template hosted by the Open Science Framework as a great place to start. It has three qualities. One, that it is timestamped, so when you publish the pre-registration, there is a time attached to it. This is important to uh, analyze and evaluate whether the data had already been collected or not. It's indexed, which means it's searchable, and so you can find other pre-registrations or indeed have your own pre-registration search for using keywords or titles in the pre-registration. And it's persistent. Once you've published, it will be archived in perpetuity. And these three qualities are incredibly important for a pre-registration, and the Open Science Framework template makes it easy to have uh, that as your those qualities in your registration. Steve Harose in uh, in the preprint that I've linked below has a useful comparison of these platforms and further tips on how to use registration templates and how to get the best out of it. Here I'm going to suggest what I think are the best registration practices for different components of the registration. So here we talk about the hypotheses. First, in the hypothesis, you will be asked to list specific, concise, and testable hypotheses. And I think this is a great place to think about whether your work is exploratory, outcome-dependent, or confirmatory, outcome-independent. So this is important because exploratory work may uh, inform your future studies. So being open about what the outcomes are uh, and that you're looking for, so that you're looking for outcomes to inform what you'll do next uh, is helpful. Uh, this may also reveal whether hypothesis testing is actually appropriate for the question you have in mind. I also think it's great to justify your hypotheses. And the best way to do this, in my opinion, is to specify the theories and the formal models that inform your hypotheses and make predictions about the effect. The reason I think formal models are important is by attaching your verbal theories to mathematical equations, you make concrete what the predictions will be, and this will also help indicate what will constitute evidence for or against the theories. It's also in critical that you use unambiguous language to list out your hypotheses. The next thing that's important in a registration is listing out your data collection procedures. I highly recommend that you pilot all your experimental procedures beforehand to ensure that your, uh, your experimental protocol provides you with the data that you're expecting. Also, you should state all of the measured variables in your registration, and you should include any experimental code you use. And this is a great place to nudge that your experimental code needs to be uh, reviewed or should be reviewed for readability and reproducibility. And this may uh, share the responsibility for ensuring a reproducible code among your collaborators in your project. It's also really important to be clear about data handling and cleaning procedures because um, your, you should specify any data exclusion procedures and treatment of missing values and outliers in a principled way rather than in a post hoc way which may be, uh, which may be mistaken or taken for p-hacking. So being clear about how you handle missing values or how you're handling the data can help protect you later on at a review stage. Sample size is incredibly important to ensuring your research is robust and reliable. So you, you should provide justifications for your sample size as well as the number of trials. 
And I think the best practice is to estimate the statistical power for the critical effect or test. Note that the power for an overall main effect is not the same as your interaction. So if your interaction is your critical effect, you should try and power or estimate what power you have for the, inter for the interaction. Note that you can uh, justify your sample size in various ways. You can include a justified stopping rule, such as in a Bayesian manner where you've, you stop when you've found enough evidence for a certain hypothesis versus a different one. Or you may have a principled endpoint such as a date or a deadline when the experiment needs to be completed by. Daniel Larkins has a useful paper for various ways you can justify your sample size that I've listed below there. The last thing is your analysis plan. I think it's great to conduct your analysis on simulated or pilot data prior to your pre-registration. Your pilot data, simulated, simulated data can inform your power analysis. And it's great to have your analysis code ready to go before the data comes in. Because one, you can ensure your analysis code has no mistakes and is reviewed, especially by any uh, collaborators in your project. And this is a good opportunity to share and upload your analysis code too. Make sure to include all specific analyses that are planned, but note that new analyses after the data collected is totally fine. You just have to be transparent about it and state which analyses were not pre-registered in your manuscript. I really want to note here that pre-registration does not necessarily mean good science. Pre-registration is not sufficient to produce robust and reliable research, and pre-registration is not necessary to produce robust and reliable research. Here's a little toy example. One may pre-register a simple t-test in one condition, predicting there would be an effect. And one could pre-register a simple t-test in a separate condition, predicting there's no effect, but then incorrectly interpret this as a significant moderation of the effect. Because they haven't actually tested whether the, um, statistically tested whether that moderation or that interaction is significant or not. So pre-registration does not necessarily good make mean good science, and a pre-registration is not necessarily going to solve all of the problems that I listed at the start of this talk. Note that it's probably not the most efficient method to slow researchers down and improve experimental design, and it's not a principled or clear method of producing better theories in of itself. So pre-registration is probably not the best hallmark of rigorous and reproducible research, but I will note that preliminary evidence suggests that pre-registration has reduced the proportion of positive results. An estimate, recent estimate, suggests it's approximately 66% compared to 96% in the standard papers. I also like to highlight registered reports, which I think is um, the future of science. A pre-registration is the first stage of a registered report, which is a new publication format. It, the pre-registration is reviewed by external peer reviewers prior to data collection. And they can uh, suggest um, and add to the registration uh, based on their expertise. And this may address any potential mistakes or any unconsidered decisions, and hopefully that reduces research waste. It can also address those annoying review requests for additional experiments, um, sometimes known as critiques after results known, which is having seen the results just suggesting additional experiments or additional ideas. Stage two um, is peer review of the research manuscript. And note that this is accepted in principle if you have followed along your pre-registration. And this addresses publication bias or the file draw problem where we perceive that significant results are more likely to be accepted for publication and also perceived as more impactful by higher tier journals. Hopefully I showed you before that it's important to see the total landscape and know whether there are positive and negative results in our entire literature. Registered reports have been shown to uh, increase the percentage of null findings being reported. You can see here uh, in both novel and replication registered reports, it appears to be approximately 60% or so, uh, whereas in the traditional literature, it's closer to 10%, um, so in line with those uh, 95 percent estimates of positive findings in the standard literature. Here I'm going to detail some of the benefits of pre-registration for early career researchers. I think it's a great framework for communicating and discussing experimental design with your supervisor and collaborators. For example, it's a record of the experiment design and analysis decisions and the reasons for them, and it answers a reviewer who may ask why you did this 
and sometimes a forgetful PI who made those decisions in the first place to run the experiment. It's also useful when you yourself have collected the data, and this may take years, so it may be good to revisit this record to remind yourself what the uh, initial experiment rationale was. It brings review and feedback to an earlier stage in the research process. A lot of early career researchers are thrown into running experiment and are often uncertain and unsure whether they're doing the right thing. So by having this pre-registration, they can get review and feedback and ask questions that, uh, about the experiments to make sure that they understand what's going on and that it seems to be um, what they're expecting. And this can initiate illuminating discussions, perhaps arguments between collaborators about what the theory is or the experimental rationale is. It also seems to prevent research waste because it encourages a justified sample size calculation, so a good target for early career researchers. It increases the likelihood of publishing, especially when there's a negative result, and as I mentioned, can protect you from reviewer critiques based on results known as carking. And it also reduces the chances of mistakes and erroneous experiments, which could waste a lot of the early career researchers' precious time. It can accompany writing of the experimental analysis code. Again, this means uh, with a pre-registration, pre you can share the responsibility for making sure the experimental analysis code is readable and reproducible. And it's also helpful with the eventual writing process because the pre-registration is essentially the method section of a paper already written and it's a record of the rationale and theory for the experiment that you can revisit in writing your introduction. There are a few barriers to pre-registration that may be perceived by those who are uncertain. Uh, for example, some may perceive that because this is an extra step in the research workflow, it's an additional time cost, but I think it saves time because it prevents you from making research mistakes. It also saves you time in writing because the methods are essentially already written and can help inform your introduction. And the analysis code could already be written for when the data comes in. So it's essentially just a shifting of the time dedicated to an analysis code earlier to the research process. Some may worry that the pre-registration is also an additional ven venue for scrutiny of errors, but this is caught prior to data being collected and the responsibility for the errors is now shared amongst all collaborators rather than pinned on potentially the early career researcher. And note that a culture of taking responsibility for errors should be applauded. And another concern with pre-registration is that you may be locked into a research plan, but deviations of the pre-registration are allowed as long as that is made clear and transparent in the manuscript. I created a reading list on pre-registration here are 10 papers and some short summaries and also some linked resources, often the um, given video talks by the uh, authors themselves, uh, which you can access here if you'd like to learn a bit more about pre-registration. In summary, uh, pre-registration can be a useful tool for improving the quality of your research. And I think this happens because you can inform your pre-registration with formal theories, pilot studies, power analysis, and reproducible code. I think it's a great framework to discuss and agree upon research decisions between collaborators. And it's a great place to ex receive external feedback for your experimental design and prevent research waste. And lastly, it will increase the credibility of your work during peer review. You can find these slides available on my website or get in touch with me at Twitter. And I'm happy to receive any emails or que uh, questions or comments via email. Thank you.